Okay. So who have a profit motive. So they're trying to make some money at their livestock or poultry business. So we started in 2007, we started a building farmers and ranchers program. And we've held these classes in seven different areas. And as you can see, you know, primarily along the I-25 corridor, huge, you know, that's our greatest population density, but also west on I-70 near Grand Junction. We had one mountain region course. And then the Four Corners is just a hub of specialty crop and livestock development. And so we did have a class there that we've had three years worth of classes. And so we've seen tremendous growth in what's available in the farmers markets, what restaurant offerings are. So these these producers are definitely finding market outlets, but it takes a lot of guidance. It takes a lot of counseling to get them there. So just a little bit more background. A couple of phases of this program, there's a classroom setting. And so in that, we teach three different things. We teach strategic business planning, marketing, record keeping, and financial analysis. We want them to get the basics of a business plan, get it sketched, get it started. So they can, you know, they can really have a sound foundation. And then depending on the area, we teach, um, you know, how do you access additional labor? How do you compensate that labor? How do you develop contracts for land, for water, maybe sales contracts, um, custom service contracts? How do you access equipment? How do you get agricultural credit? And a lot of subjects. And so we really try to connect them with a lot of information. What they get out of this then is they get the foundation of a business plan that they can they can start working from. They have something maybe they can present to a lender, and that lender could be a family member, could be someone in the credit community. They get to present their business plan to their colleagues, which is really neat because they get some they get some very constructive feedback. And but through this whole classroom experience, and then we have a field experience piece too. They get to interact with a lot of experienced producers, and they develop a great community, a great network of producers that they can consult with, that they can get advice from as they start to build their businesses. The the field based part of this is really needed. Our, our experiential learning piece is our way of giving them some production knowledge without really teaching that in the class because we want to focus we do this over eight weeks we want to focus on business basics and so they have two different opportunities and one is a mentorship where they might have 20 hours of um, consulting time that they can call a producer and ask some just some questions maybe about feeding veterinary care they can do production planning get some marketing advice We've had some producers who've wanted to start meat CSAs and things that are a little bit complex. So, you know, how do you go about doing that? We try to hook them up then with a producer who's already traveled that route and, and can give them some good advice. Internships are paid work experiences. And so those are a little bit different. They're not as um, targeted in terms of the learning goals of the participant who are one of our class participants, but they get to go work on another producer's farm or ranch. And then the other thing that we're looking at are some coaching groups and other ways of providing technical assistance because we realize there's a lot more experiential learning opportunities that we can provide to help people with their, their business development. So, you know, what are, what are some of the things that we try to incorporate into this planning? Well, obviously, we want our producers to plan for appropriate environmental stewardship. We want them to have good production practices, safe handling all the way from farm to fork. And we really do emphasize that. We spend a lot of time on that. We want them to comply with all of their local business licensing, state of Colorado, if they have employees and need to have, you know, comply with federal um, employee and, and tax laws. We want them to do that. We also um, teach them about some and, and help them to explore some new market opportunities for their products. And this is a, a really burgeoning area in terms of niche livestock and poultry. And the last thing is, is really looking at some of these other kind of 
boundaries that they might have to deal with, and those might be might be zoning issues. And so we want them to really look at this as a comprehensive planning process and not get so focused on production that they forget that they're actually going to be selling a product too. We want them to have a very realistic plan. So what I'm going to talk about today are really those last two um, looking at new market opportunities and, and kind of scrutinizing some of the, the planning and zoning issues that might affect our urban and peri-urban producers because they really are important in terms of how and where you can build a small-scale livestock business. Um, and just, you know, just to reiterate, we really try to explain to them how important a foundation you know, stewardship is, especially when you are, you have neighbors on all sides, you know, to be very con considerate, very concerned about odors, about noise, dust that you might generate, any insects that, you know, that are on your property likely are going to, you know, travel to your neighbor's property. Same with predator problems. And we have a lot of people who think they can just casually bury a, a mortality. Well, that's not true, you know. They, they need to understand what all the local regulations are and all of the, the appropriate management practices um, because that, A, their operation is going to be a lot cleaner, which can and that can certainly affect their marketing opportunities. Their animals are going to be healthier, and they're going to have a lot better relationships. And those neighbors are kind of, there are two aspects to those neighbors. You know, they're the ones who are going to support them if they maybe have to go before their planning and zoning board and say, I'd like some kind of a variance because I'd like to have a farm stand or something. So they're kind of, they're that community support. But they're also customers. And so we really want people to think through how diligent they are about their stewardship practices on their property. Because, as you know, these things all tie together. You know, you are you're building your customer base, you're building your community, and you're also hopefully building really good business processes um, that'll help you have in the long term a sustainable business. So I want to just look at some of the new market opportunities that producers come to us with, with ideas that they, they see a way to brand their product and they think that it will garner them some you know, significant market share. And so what we, we try to help them do is understand, okay, you know, there are these certification programs. What, what are the, the costs and the benefits? What are the opportunities for you as a producer? You know, how does this fit into your production planning? What kind of market opportunities does it permit you? And this is really important because consumers are so interested in where their food comes from at this time. And one of the overriding concerns is animal welfare. And about 18 months ago, we did a survey among Coloradans, and it was about agriculture in general. But one of the things we asked was for them to rank um, certain issues of concern. Well, animal welfare came above the welfare of agricultural workers in our state. And so that really tells you something. I mean, people are very concerned about how animals are treated. And so one way to be able to really attest to your production practices is through certification. And there are different kinds of certification. You know, you can attest yourself that you have certain practices. You know, you've, you've pastured your animals. You've allowed them certain roaming space. You have certain um, housing for them. Your feed is, we have a lot of producers now who are looking at non-soy, non-GMO feed. You know, there are lots of different ways that, that you can... Um, you know, you can document your own practices, but then people are interested in having another party come in and say, well, actually, you know, it's, there is some official attestation here. So a couple of those certification systems, the ones that are much more well-known, they, they can provide some great market opportunities. We have retailers, wholesalers, we have restaurants who are very interested in featuring meat products, um, and eggs that come, on, they've only been produced through a certain practice. You know, they may be animal welfare approved is one of the larger ones in our state. Certified naturally grown is, is growing. Of course, USDA organic is also, is very well known. But, you know, how, how well is it used among smaller scale producers? In fact, how well used are any of these? And we have a lot of folks who come in who are very interested in pursuing this, 
But then what we, we try to say is, yes, it will create some market opportunity, but it depends on the scale. It depends on your cost structure, too, if this is really going to be a viable avenue for you. So what we did is a little bit of background research, and all of this is on a website. I'll show you at the end if you're interested in seeing a lot more detail. And I did forget to mention the other two um, certifications that we looked at were kosher and halal, because those can also, you know, the ethnic markets are present a great opportunity, but there are some constraints there in terms of timing of production and animal processing that are, you know, are really tricky for smaller scale producers and sometimes any scale of producer to negotiate. So what we did is we looked at all of those um, certification programs that I listed and we said, okay, you need to understand how the program goals align with your goals. You know, do you really believe that this is the way, you know, your, your animal housing should be constructed? Um, Understand the certification process because the time frame sometimes can be really long. The cost can be very prohibitive. And so we really wanted our producers to have a good understanding of how it might fit in with when they, um, what their income goals were, when they were expecting to have their income flows start. Because, you know, that could be, the certification could be if you need to have that animal from, from birth you know, that might mean, you know, you need to wait a while until you can raise those animals according to the particular standards. Costs can be, can be pretty prohibitive. So, you know, we touched on some of the benefits. Certainly access to, to new markets, that's for sure. Possibility of charging higher prices. Absolutely, in the farmer's markets we see that, but we also see that there's a lot of, there's a lot of price setting in our farmer's markets, but there's very limited number of vendors. And so if you're counting on going into a farmer's market with your certified naturally grown product, there may not be space for another livestock product vendor there. And so we see a lot of difficulties for some of our producers who are planning on farmer's markets when they, when they have livestock products. I mean, we typically only have one person selling beef, one person selling bison meat. I mean, the, the market managers try to control that sales environment so that they can retain a good producer. The ability to connect with customers is a really big one, of course, and that's why, you know, that's why people are interested in some of these, because they can align their values or show that their values are aligned with those of their customers. Some of the certification programs, like um, American Grass-Fed Association Certified Naturally Grown, have marketing materials, and so you pay for those, but you also get the logo. You may get some marketing assistance, as well as maybe some co-promotion from that organization that can be really mm -hmm. helpful, depending on the markets that you're, you're targeting. So the costs, then, of course, are um, can be, you know, pretty pretty difficult sometimes to, to calculate. So, you know, one of the things, and we'll look at this when I talk briefly about planning and zoning, but you may not have the land base necessary for, um, that's required by that certification program. And so that, in, and in Colorado in particular, where we have very strict um, animal, animal unit requirements for certain um, areas, that, that can be a big constraint. You know, changes in how you treat your animals. I know growers who provide, you know, they provide no veterinary care at all, and others who are very quick to, they provide a lot of, of prophylactic care too. Well, you may not be able to do that with that sort of, you know, with the certification protocol, or you may need to withdraw your animal if you're going to treat it. Feeding, of course, feed costs have done nothing but, but go, go up. And we've seen our growers have a lot of difficulty sourcing the feed, organic feed, for example. And, and we've seen some of our herds really, some of our growers have to reduce their herds because they just, they can't procure the feed that they need. I mentioned housing and then record keeping. All of these programs require a lot of record keeping. You need to document your, you know, breeding. You need to document health. You need to document um, all of your all of your costs. Of course, you need to keep those to make sure that you know you know where if you're making a profit or not. Um, but some of the some of the documentation can be pretty onerous, and so you need to figure out: can you do this, or do you need to have someone else to help you with that? So the second thing that I wanted to touch on is 
um, that's that's really tied again to these these potential marketing opportunities is where you are located geographically. And as I said, you know, a lot of our producers are our urban edge producers, and we see a lot of run-ins. Come January, February, my phone's just ringing off the hook with people who are are wondering, you know, how can they work with their um, planning or zoning department to increase some as you know, change some aspect about their livestock operation. Maybe have a milking parlor, have some people, you know, school children come in and turn it into kind of another type of value added enterprise. Well, you know, the the there certainly are very strict zoning requirements in Colorado, and um, and there are in other states too. That's for sure. Um, all of our zoning is um, is controlled at the local level. And so it's different from county to county, too, and from municipality to municipality. So it's really kind of a, you know, it's a big challenge for our producers to develop a business plan without consulting with their county, with their city, if they're located within the, the city limits. Some of, um, some of our growers are within a homeowners association and they may have very specific requirements too you know about the numbers and types of animals that are allowed and you know this had been mentioned earlier but and and I'll show you a couple of examples but some of our municipalities will allow you know maybe four hens no roosters two turkeys or no turkeys and so you know if you're looking at building a small scale poultry business you're really bounded by those those land use provisions and of course, slaughter. Except, I think, in you know, there are very few mun municipalities that allow allow slaughter of any animal. So, you know, what we what we counsel our growers to do is to look at some of these considerations. You know, do you need a permit? Is that permit? What's that permit going to cost you? Is it one time? Is it annual? Um, you know, what do you need to do in terms of the type of structure for for housing? Um, fencing, where all of your confinement or your um, pasture areas, your housing areas, where do they have to be located on your property? Do you physically have enough space to do that? A lot of municipal regs, at least in Colorado, say it has to be set back from a property line. Well, you know, then you start to really run into some issues about what your land base can support. Um, and then, of course, there are a lot of standards for noise and odor and dust, as in sometimes none at all. And so then you really need to have some pretty specific um, management protocols. Um, just a, a couple of examples, and I know it's, it's small, but it gives you a sense of around the state of Colorado just how variable some of our regs can be. And so they do, you know, they really do put some limitations on the kind of business that, that you can develop. So, you know, at the top, we've got um, Fort Collins, you know, where you've got a limited number of chickens. Um, and then you've got Lakewood, where they say, you know, there's, there's no limit. If you look at, at um, hogs and small ruminants, you know, sometimes there's an, acre, an actual acreage in, um, in areas and sometimes, you know, it's none allowed at all. And so it really does present some, some hurdles for our business owners. So, you know, what we counsel people are don't even, don't purchase an animal don't even market an animal until you have gone and presented your entire business plan to your um, your county land use department, your your city officials, and make sure that you know you can be in compliance because the way that you're looking at your business now and the way you might want it to grow just may not be feasible given your your zoning. And then always, always, if you're looking at increasing animal numbers, if you're looking at any kind of increases of the types of, of activities that you're conducting on your property, make sure you consult with your um, local land use officials before you make any changes because we've definitely seen folks who have had to cease operation while they get into compliance and that's not where you want to be. So you definitely want to work with your local officials. And, you know, just kind of coming back to that graphic is we really want people to be able to, within all of these limitations in that kind of urban edge, we want them to be able to develop profitable businesses, but we want them to not be pie in the sky. You know, we want them to base their expectations on something that's that's really realistic. A um, couple of 
resources here, the some of the um, business planning documents, that certification information that I mentioned is there. And then we collect some farmer's market prices. So we've got meat and egg prices from around the state, which is a really good, it's good planning information for our growers. And then um, for them to understand from county, state, and federal regs, we have a, a compendium of market regulations that, that they can refer to. So. That's kind of the you know the summary of um, of what we do and and some of our philosophy in in Colorado in terms of helping our our producers adjust their expectations to reality and be successful. You mentioned slaughter. Yeah. Is that in slaughter for your own use? Yeah, but just not, you know, well, there are some, in, it depends. I mean, I, some municipalities say no slaughter at all. We definitely know people who, who do that, you know. But, a, mo, you know, there are some where you can slaughter for your own use, too. 